Welcome to the podcast, Entrepreneur Perspectives, building and protecting your business one podcast at a time, a Cas Source production. In this episode, I get the opportunity to chat with the founder and CEO of To You Laundry, Alex Smirzniak. This episode exists because of Cas Source. Cas Source is your content team. You know how many business leaders need help communicating their story? That's what we do. Content strategy, creation, and distribution for business leaders. This provides opportunities, relationships, and a platform for you and your business. Why do we do this? Because at CadSource, we exist to help you create and share amazing content. And yes, you should have a podcast. We'll help you. Learn more by visiting kezcontent.com. To You brings a new spin on laundry and dry cleaning. With To You service, you'll even have more time to do what you enjoy and do best. To You has been around for over four years now, and with so many changes in the world, since we last featured To You Laundry in January of 2019, we have much to catch up on. So what are Alex and his team up to? How did COVID-19 impact their business? What's in their future? And what thoughts does Alex have for you? We discuss that and much more in this conversation with leader Alex Smirzniak. Where is your board? Are they all over the country? Are they mostly in the Southeast? So mostly in the Southeast, two in Atlanta and one here. Okay. One's the former CEO of Sweetwater Brewing and now president and CFO of Spanx, so Sarah Blakely's company. And then one's the CEO of 360i. It's the top five digital marketing agency in the country. Okay. And then Eric Eubank, who's the founding partner of Pamlico Capital, which is here in Charlotte. Okay. Was everyone focused on burn rate? Like we got to stop spending right now? Was that a focus early on? Yeah, their thought was just like, there's so much uncertainty, like sit on as much cash as you can. Because fortunately, we had just raised the Series A at the end of last year. And their thought was, if it's not profitable, don't spend right now. We got, Let's just wait for new information and keep the good parts of the business running. Sure. Did you have tough decisions to make as a result of that with employees? Yeah, I mean, it was... One of the shittiest things I had to do, I've ever had to do. I mean, shut markets down, laying people off. Yeah. It was not fun at all. Have you come out on the other side of that at all, bringing people back? Are we still kind of in the middle of it? Or have you guys seen more efficiencies as a result of just what you've gone through the last few months? Like a lot of companies, like, wow, we can be pretty efficient with this. A little bit of both. I mean, we've been a lot more efficient than I thought we could have been. We also had some of those hard truths that I think you kind of think about in the back of your head, but don't really you know, want to fully face reality because everything's, everything's so busy and moving so fast that it's easy to be like, ah, that's just like a bad thought. I'll push it aside and deal with it later. This really forces us to look in the mirror and our board challenge us to you know, come back to them and present what are the things you're good at doing? What are the things you guys suck at doing? And just have an acknowledge that you're bad at. Yeah. What parts of the business model are weak and your blind spots that we should address? And they want us to kind of white slate, clear slate the business. And if you could start all over with all the money you've got now, all the learnings you have, the team that's learned and failed and succeeded the last three years, what would you do if you could just start from scratch? And that was a super helpful exercise. I mean, we had the whole company in here socially distanced at the time. I remember this was like in March and people are all wearing masks and spread out. And we were just this huge brainstorming session. And Honestly, change the whole course that we're headed on now, which yeah. is kind of one of the things I'm excited to talk to you about is this pivot that we're going through. Yeah, that's exciting. I and mean, we'll just keep going from here. I mean, that's what I like to do is bounce around and get into the strategies you guys are working at and obviously dealing with the challenges that everyone's dealing with, but you individually and as a business. That's a great question, though. Like, if you could start all over, because you guys are in an industry that's like, no, we're in the laundry industry. This is like archaic in many ways or very old school. We relate to it because my business started in the insurance business. Again, an archaic industry. They're still using systems that were created in the 1980s and they're having a hard (laughs) time adjusting to it. Our way of looking at it was like telling stories, creating content, content marketing, and building our business that way. Still staying true to that insurance business is using the content to make new connections. And it's worked out. But it's an interesting thing because we'll see people in business that are tied to the way they always did it. Always did it mean, hey, last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, whatever that might be, even if it's just a couple of years, we were doing it this way and we got to stay on this track. And you guys kind of went backwards and said, no, 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 we're going to start from scratch. And it's an unbelievable advice to have from your board. So you guys were obviously in a growth mindset when we first started chatting, you go into Atlanta, you got Raleigh, you're like probably looking all over the country, like what's <laughs> next? Is growth still a part of what you guys are looking at? Is it, a, you just said things have changed a little bit. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. So I mean, growth's definitely still part of it, but I'd say it used to be priority one is all we talked about. Everyone was rallying you know, to that beat of that drum. And now it's taken a little bit of a backseat and it's 
what's the new means to that same end? You know, we still want to grow rapidly. We still want to become a, the first nationally recognized brand in the space. But instead of launching new markets and doing the model that we were doing, it's a completely different means, but to the same end. And what I mean by that is when we did that exercise, we looked at what are the risks, what are the gaps, what are we good at, et cetera. And the things that presented themselves is to you is not a mass market product. We thought at first it was like, this is Postmates, this is Uber, you know, thousands of people are using it a day. It's millennials, et cetera. And really it's kind of your affluent household, 100, 150K plus. It's an affordable luxury. We're not Lamborghini or Porsche, but we're also not your Honda or your Toyota or, or probably a Lexus or somewhere in between. And so with that, we've wanted to add more customizations, more premium enhancements that we can mirror exactly how you, know, you would do your laundry at home versus where we were before, which was try to get as cheap as possible and so that we can sell it to as many people as possible. So that's one theme. The second and third theme which tie together is there was a huge component of labor risk in our business before. We had you know, 130 employees, of which 85 were hourly employees, drivers, people folding, sorting, cleaning the clothes. And that's tough to scale. I mean, I think it's possible. There's a lot of companies that have done it, but it's very hard, especially something as mundane and kind of meticulous as doing laundry. And then the third theme that I'll tie those two together here in a second was the vertical integration that we did. So we partnered with Electrolux, built our own state-of-the-art laundry facility here in Charlotte. First of its kind, it services both a retail demographic, but also is a warehouse Monday through Friday to produce all of two use pickup and delivery business because it's an asset utilization play. Most laundromats generate 70% of their revenue on Saturday and Sunday. Monday through Friday, the equipment sits almost completely dead and underutilized, but that's when pickup and delivery is busiest for us. And so our thought was, how do we do more of that? I mean, that's really the key to unlocking this whole model we've discovered. Charlotte became uber profitable as soon as we built that store, but they're capitally intensive, does slow us down a little bit because you have to build those. And that's when we realized, could we start franchising just the brick and mortar component Smaller footprint doesn't need to be this massive mega facility like we have here in Charlotte. It could be three to four thousand square feet instead of sixty five hundred, and then layer two you on top of those franchisees as a national account. So basically, two you still is kind of the Postmates to you know McDonald's or Chick fil A. Hey, Chick fil A is still doing its thing. McDonald's is still doing its thing, but Postmates is bringing in another thirty percent of orders out the back door through their platform, and that's what two you would be to these franchisees. So we're actually working with Jeff Dude, and I saw him on the podcast. Yeah. Small world. (laughs) He's helping us bundle it all up right now. We actually should sell our first two units here in the next month or so. Oh, wow. That's good. So you'll still have the two trucks and everything's going to stay the same, but you're just adding different layers to it. Correct. Yep. Okay. And now this is happening in Charlotte. So when I say growth too, are you looking to expand into other cities still at this point? Yeah. So we've got a list of a few thousand customers in Atlanta that are kind of just all chomping at the bits. When are you guys coming back? When are you turning service back on? And we promised ourselves, look, we're going to do it right the next time. We're not going to... Because we launched Atlanta while we just vertically integrated for the first time. And we were trying to do two things at the same time, which I think you have to do as a startup. You have limited time. But now that we know that vertical integration works, we don't want to go into a city until we have it, at least a network of it, whether it's corporate stores or franchise stores there. The margin and the quality control is just so much better. So what, right now, when we sell these first few units, we're aggressively gunning for selling them in Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh, so that we can turn those customers back on as soon as possible. Yeah, there was a willingness to listen that you have here too, that you thought early on that it was for the masses, right? And then you've kind of adjusted, you've pivoted, you see what your niche is, and, and that's important. And you go into the affluent market. And it's interesting because like we, my family, might not be an everyday user of 2U Laundry, but we are a user of 2U Laundry. Our washer breaks, our dryer breaks. It just happened. It was funny because when you guys had reached out to us about the podcast, it was right <laughs> around the same time. I don't know if you like you sent some signals over there, but the dryer broke, right? And then the washer broke and then the dryer broke. It was like right behind each other. And we used to you for, I don't know, five, six different times in a row. And like you said, it was an affordable luxury that we had. And we we're grateful to have it because I got three kids. We got stuff mm-hmm. coming in and out. And It was necessary. And so how are people using it right now? I mean, obviously, you might have people who live in in condos or different places in the Charlotte area. Are people in the suburbs? I see the truck and I'm right on Providence and Ballantyne Common. So I see your trucks driving by. They're always clean. They're always spotless. They're driving well down the street. What type of people are using it? Is it the daily user? Is it people like us? Is it a combination? It's honestly a combination. I mean, we, of course, want the heavy cleaners, right? And those are people that are using it two or three times a week. I mean, they... It is now a part of their family's routine. They're using it constantly. They've budgeted for it. In some cases, they get rid of the house cleaner because they'd rather have help with the laundry and they swap that out. 
And so that's really what we're going for. But at the same time, it's the economics, the unit economics work well enough that for the one-off user whose washer or dryer broke, or they're just having a stressful week at work, or they just got back from vacation and they just want a little bit of a break. We're fine with that too. I mean, it's built into the model to make sense. And the more route density there is, whether it's the weekly recurring user or the one-off users, as long as that route is dense, it's sufficient for us to go and service basically anyone. But what we're trying to do is instead of being so focused on the millennial kind of one-off dry cleaning user being more intentional about going after those families that that do have that recurring need. Yeah. Well, there's the recurring need. And then you have like, there's this consistent need, like when camps were in session and kids would come back from overnight camp. I remember we used that as well. And it was like, here, take this just truckload of stuff and you guys deal with it. But there's something to it because that's a valuable, how many loads of laundry is that going to be if someone were to do that in the house and to have that type of unit? How does the laundry industry see you guys? Yeah, so it's funny. Like, so Electrolux loved it. They looked at us as, holy shit, they could start to consolidate the brick and mortar locations and just the industry in general for the first time. Because right now it's this disparate, kind of highly fragmented mom and pops laundromats that they do some over the counter wash rack right full, but they're not doing pickup and delivery. That's a new service in a lot of cities. New York has it, Chicago, LA, bigger cities, you know, tier one cities have it. But your Charlotte's, Raleigh's, Atlanta's, Nashville's, you know, basically everything but LA, Chicago, New York don't have it, but people want it. There's still affluent people that want to exchange dollars for time. And so from that sense, it's kind of a new segment. We're not really you know, rubbing shoulders with anyone there. If anything, we're complementary to existing laundromats or what will be our you know, laundromat franchise. The less customer headache I have to deal with, it's one of you versus a thousand individuals you know, asking me for stuff. And I just get to focus on running a really good, efficient operation. And so we, we become an aggregator for them and they love that. Yeah. Storytelling is obviously sharing of content. I mean, you're obviously out here, you're getting on podcasts. Dan was on the podcast in the past. We've written an article about you guys in the past. It uses an example because you mentioned the thing about time and saving time. It's like, if I need to aerate my lawn, I don't want to aerate my lawn. I'm going to hire someone to aerate my lawn because I have other things that I want to do with my family or myself, whatever that might be. So there's importance there. But sharing those stories, telling that type of thing about time is obviously important to you. You go to your website, it's very clear you guys spend a lot of time on your marketing with you guys being out in public. I know you guys have attended entrepreneur events and and really just making sure that people understand the to you story. Why do you see that as so important? Is it your background in marketing? Is it because you have to get out there? Is it because you're bored? Or what is it with you guys and making sure you have a great brand that's out there? I mean, I think sales and marketing are everything. I mean, I'm more of an ops finance person, but even then I recognize without the customers, without the sales, you don't have operations, you don't have finance, you have nothing else. And so Early on, we got advice that storytelling is. It's if you're not good at that, you can have the best product in the world. It's not going to matter. And so Dan and I have always tried to be intentional about getting that story out there and also selling what we're really selling. At the end of the day, it's not clean clothes. It's certainly the mechanism we use to deliver what we're really selling, but it is time back. It's those memories with family. It's going on that trip that you wanted to go on and not have to have the stress when you come back. Or it's the side project or passion you're pursuing that chores could be eating into. It's the same reason you mentioned aerating your lawn. And we just we want to get that out there. Is important. Yeah. What's the future with content as it relates to to you laundry? Yeah. So now, right now, we've kind of we're waiting and watching and seeing, especially with us rebuilding right now. So a lot of it's just been organic, which has been surprising to me. How much is still happening? How many new signups are still coming in with basically zero marketing spend? Which shows there's you know, some viral coefficient that we probably were undervaluing earlier on and not playing on enough. But right now, it's you know how do we get franchises out there because they really we want those to grow out in front of us. We want to be in Charlotte, Nashville, Raleigh, and then layer two on top. So a lot of the content's becoming more focused on, hey, you know, your 401k is doing great, but the economies or the you know the job market's kind of in question. The world's a little bit in question. Now's the time to go start your own thing. You've wanted to be entrepreneurial, but you're not really sure how. Hey, why don't you get in bed with someone like us who's just setting out to build something big, and we can show you that shortcut and flatten that learning curve for you as you want to go out and pursue that. For sure. Yeah. You've been hearing a lot about it that franchisee work at a larger company. There's all these different opportunities as opposed to just building something from scratch. How are they coming across you? Is it someone like Jeff that you had talked about earlier? Is it social media? Is it just awareness? You're like, wow, what is this company doing? And you're out in front of these organizations. How are they coming across you guys? Yeah. So from the franchising side, it's going to be broker networks. So, you know, life coaches that go represent people in the job market that mm-hmm. are either got laid off or thinking about leaving. That's one angle. We have a Facebook and digital marketing campaign that surprisingly a lot of franchisers don't do. Hopefully not many are listening right now and start tapping into this. Yeah, right. (laughs) 
but you can get the cheapest. It's like kind of money ball, right? There's these white spaces that people aren't playing in and you can get the same quality leads for a tenth of the cost. And we've already seen good evidence of that already being the case compared to the benchmarks we've seen from other franchisors that have shared information with us. So there's a digital content strategy. There's a you know, in-person true sales process to it. I mean, I think referrals and just tapping into our network has always been big to us. We have the Techstars network, the Endeavor network, the Charlotte, Atlanta, just ecosystem network, our investor network. And we already have 80 or so leads just from that that are all kind of chomping at the bit to get into this. It's a self-absentee model that kicks off 100, 150K plus a year in cash flow with really 10 hours of work a week or so. Wow. A lot of people are excited about that. Yeah. Well, you bring up the point about social media and people are always assuming they're kind of like on the outside looking at Facebook. I don't want to waste time with Facebook, but not realizing what an opportunity it is. And also the costs have been driven down during COVID because less people are spending on it. People that were just in on a daily basis aren't doing it. It's interesting. In our neighborhood, we have a Facebook group. And when I talked about the dryer being broken, what I came to find out is people were looking at these dryer vent companies. If you blow your dryer vent out, you fix your dryer a little bit. And people in the neighborhood were saying, well, I need that, or I need that, and I need that. There's like a hundred people needed it. We had already done it, but I'm still watching. They're still talking about it. This dryer <laughs> vent company is going to get a hundred customers. And it's all based on about a Facebook group. There's absolutely no marketing. What this person probably did is they did a little bit of good work inside of Facebook. Their name gets mentioned. It's no different than when 2U Laundry shows up. You guys got the blue bag sitting outside of the house, or you tell your neighbor like, wow, you got to use this. You got to go to your laundry. Have you seen that play itself out on social media, be it on Facebook or probably Instagram as well? We're like, oh, I found out about you because of Facebook. And obviously social media is a big deal, but was it that big of a deal for 2U Laundry? Oh, it was huge. I mean, our first 600 customers came from the exact way you just talked about. I mean, we would post you know, in Facebook groups and people would catch on to it. But then as soon as customers, real customers, you know, would come in, it wasn't us kind of like self-promoting like, hey guys, check this out. We'd have real customers use it, tell us how it saved their week, it alleviated XYZ pain point, give a referral code. I need everyone to know about this. We'd create one for them. They'd go post in mom Facebook groups, workout Facebook groups. And we would go in there and we'd just watch. And same thing, you just mentioned hundreds of comments of, of, oh my God, I'm doing 10 hours a week. I'm doing five hours a week of laundry. This would be a lifesaver. And then we just saw signups through the roof. And what did we spend on that? A referral code for one person. Yeah. The one person that wants to talk, right? Yeah. It's the best. next door, same thing. Next door is just is blown up for us. And, and so some of that kind of organic growth loops we try to, to play into as well, getting our customers to become ambassadors for us has been super effective. And you've seen, obviously, because you're in this entrepreneurial world, you've seen other people not taking advantage of it because you've referenced that a couple of times. You're like, man, I hope other people aren't listening to this because they're <laughs> going to start getting these ideas. But it's right because so many people, they're not going there, right? They're thinking like, that's not going to be a place. And obviously, you'd have advice. If they were listening, you're obviously a good person. You're going to say, hey, this is what you think you should do this. And is that your advice to a lot of companies is just don't get lost in what you thought for so long and actually just test it out? Hundred percent. I mean, there's you never know when a certain thing is going to work or when it's not going to work. And early on, when we were resource strapped and constrained, it was what free options are there? And posting in Facebook groups is free, and it was arguably the most effective thing. It continues to be the most effective, even when there is a ten k a month Facebook budget or whatever it is. It still doesn't beat that organic word of mouth. It's just it's true, it's genuine, it's cheap. I mean, it's it checks all the boxes, but you still have to keep testing new and new stuff because it's always evolving and always changing and. Yeah. People are you know saturating in certain channels and you got to find the next new one that isn't. Yeah. It's interesting that a few years ago we had some people who were working for us that they are still here now and they're at an event. It was an insurance industry event. I kind of gave you that example before that we have this insurance company. And when they're at this insurance event, they went to this person who's on the marketing side. They're like, Oh, I know you guys, you're CAD source, you're that Silicon Valley company that's in the insurance industry. And he's like looking around, he's like, Silicon Valley, like, what are you talking about? They saw it as so high tech from their world because it was so foreign to them. I remember when I was talking to Dan, he's like, we're not Silicon Valley. We're not some tech company. We're in the laundry industry. We're not even really necessarily talking about disruption. But you probably hear that a lot. I mean, you guys have an app now. You have a great website. You have great marketing. You're creating things. Things are moving fast as speed. You're using social media. What type of perception is seen out there, not just maybe from the industry, but just in general, when you run into people or like, what type of company are you guys in? Do you run into that? We're like, wow, we're just huge disruptors in this marketplace. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we had labeled as a tech startup, a logistics company, and what have you. And, and there's elements to all of it, but there's so many free off the shelf things now or cheap off the shelf things now that you just got to look for it in, in magnitudes of 10x 
improve your business, whether it's operations, marketing, finance, et cetera. And just, just got to be scrappy and find those things. Yeah. Well, you're obviously scrappy because the way you started this whole thing, heard the stories back in the day at Wake Forest, you come out of this, you just kind of like, it just happened, but you also pushed, you leaned into something as well in the laundry industry. You started doing things in college and there's a lot of young people out there, just people who aspire to get into whatever it is that they want to get into. What type of advice do you have, whether they're in college, post-college, or been in their business for a while and they're looking for something different? Is it going to work at a company like yours or, or some other company and leaning into this? What should they be reading, paying attention to? Like, What's your advice from someone who's lived it and is continuing to live it? It's unique for everybody. But there's a lot that I think... Again, I say young people, but it's not. It's anybody. It's anyone who's mm -hmm. ready to take that next leap in their career and say, this is what I want to do. And I don't want it to feel like work. I, I really just like business. Maybe business is your hobby and that's okay too. So like, what type of advice you could take this in so many different directions? Obviously, it's a little bit of a general question, but what are you looking at when you're talking to people who are saying, what should I be thinking about? Don't get comfortable. I mean, that's the thing. I think a lot of people just get complacent in life and get comfortable and they, they want to do these things. They have that idea that they had at a bar with a friend, but life's comfortable. It feels safe. It feels good. And I hate that. I hate comfortability because it means I'm not learning anything. I'm I mean, not necessarily I'm not learning anything, but I'm not pushing myself to what I know what my full ceiling could be. And why wouldn't you? We all get one shot here at life. Why not? continue to be uncomfortable and push yourself to see what is that exact limit that you have and can you break through that limit and find another one. And so that, that's a really big part of it. And then once you do decide to do it, be persistent. I think that's everything. We had hundreds of people tell us no, customers get angry, buildings say no to us. And you know, we didn't give up after one or two or even you know, 80 no's that we kept going. And I think that's key too, is that the first few no's doesn't mean you have a bad product. It just means you got to listen to the market and iterate on it and make it more in line with what they want or what that market wants. It doesn't mean give up. And so those two things, don't be comfortable and be persistent, I think are the two biggest things for me. Did you ever, and it might be hard to think back to this point, but did you ever almost stop? What else were you going to do, right? Were you going to be an attorney? Were you going to work at use finance ops? Were you wanted to be like a COO type, CFO type? Did you like go down this path and you're like, mm -mm, I'm going to go back here. <laughs> it's going to be a little bit more comfortable. I mean, there had to be some points like, what am I doing? So I was at EY for two years before starting this up the second time. So I did it in college, loved it, sold it, learned a ton, made some good money, ended up going to work for EY, which I love the people. The culture was amazing. The work, not as much. It just didn't feel as fulfilling. I did feel you know a little comfortable. I was still learning, but it wasn't at the pace that I, I was wanting. It felt like there was a lot of waste in big corporate America. I couldn't live with it. So I said, screw it and quit my job. Dan, let's do this thing. He quit his job and we started in January of 16. And yeah, the first 10 months sucked. I mean, it was... <laughs> but I look back on it now, it was the most fun I've ever had. But it was... I mean, I think every two weeks, so you have two or three grown men just like, we'd you know, have a few drinks on the weekend and start crying and just like literally crying. Why are we doing this? This is so hard. All of our friends are out being 20, you know, at the time, 23, 24 year olds enjoying their lives and going out to the bars and meeting people and having fun. And we're like locked up, slaved away, working on this thing. So that was hard. I mean, that was the more temptation than anything is we are doing something that felt so different from everyone else we were talking to, regardless of age. So like, why are you doing that? Why don't you? You had a good job. It was at a big four accounting firm. And none of that really mattered to me, though. It was, I'm not fulfilled. I'm not satisfied. Even though the temptation was there, I just, I knew if I went back, I wouldn't be happy. And the thing was, the trick to me that you know, to keep doing it was talking to people were, that were in positions where I knew I was going to go had I stayed there. So partners at EY, really high up people there that as I was thinking about making this decision, thankfully were willing to give me their time and, and were honest with me. And a number of them said, hey, look, my biggest regrets in life are I had an idea when I was around your age and I didn't do it. And I think about it all the time. And they're like, yeah, I, I make really good money now and I'm you know, quote unquote successful in that realm. But I climbed someone else's ladder. I didn't build my own. And I regret that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I had a few grown men start tearing up as well as they were telling me this. And that, that just raw emotion to me was like, yep, this is it. I'm not going yeah. back. I can't go back. Yeah. This is They're giving me this genuineness. I got to take it and run with it. And That's huge. If not for me, for the other people who feel that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I appreciate you being vulnerable on it and talking about those stories. And you know, I'm sure you appreciate what they told you at that time to share in that and to say, no, this is it. Because was, my question was going to be, I was thinking about this as you were talking, is who was there to support you in this? Because we all have it. It's like, if you start something, well, no one might agree with you. But if you can find that one person, whoever that person is, it could be a family member. It could be a friend of yours. It could be, like you said, someone who used to work with and they might come to you and say something like, no, 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 keep leaning into it. Keep pushing. 
push down that wall. It's not going to be easy. No one said that's going to be easy. But that's important to have that because I think anyone who is aspiring to do something along those lines is going to inevitably run into it. And they're going to run into it again and again and again. And were you listening or reading? Was there anything that stuck out to you? Because obviously, you, you have that firsthand conversation with someone that probably beats it all. But if you listen to a podcast, if you read a book or that type of information that you can take in, was there anything that stuck out to you at that time or people going through stories? Like I remember just basic stuff like early on reading Phil Knight's book or the Amazon book and you hear the stories about they someone had to run across the street to the bank to keep the line of credit open for Amazon to stay in business. You're like, wow, that's Amazon who's having to do this. Like, Not that, that you maybe want to become an Amazon, right? But the idea still presents itself in that there's struggles in this thing. Was there anything that you were taking and consuming that also helped? Yeah, I mean, everywhere I could get it. I mean, hearing those extreme cases of adversity. I mean, the hard thing about hard things by you know, Ben Horowitz is, I think, arguably one of the best startup books I think anyone can read. And I'd highly recommend it because he just lays it out in a very fun, entertaining way of it's not going to be easy. It's not all the glamour and success and whatever it is when those companies get to those sizes. It is those anecdotal stories of Airbnb maxing out four credit cards, failing three times, and then selling the what was it, Obama O's and Captain McCain cereal during the election to raise a hundred grand to pay off their credit card debt. And then the FedEx guys had their last two hundred grand, I think it was. They were going to run out of money. Went to Vegas, put it all in black, doubled it up, and now FedEx is where you know what I mean. Right, so you hear right. these things that are just and hearing that made it so human and normal, I guess, to be doing the crazy shit that we were doing at the time that felt like we were insane. We were doing all the wrong things. And then you hear these stories of others that have gone through very similar things in their own right. And that is so encouraging and motivating and, and allows you to stick with it. So you're listening to as many podcasts, even if it's more localized ones or national ones, whatever it is, where as long as there are stories of people facing adversity in similar situations, it was helpful. And then I think having a co-founder, you know, to your point earlier about having that real kind of firsthand support, whether that's someone telling you who's 15 years ahead of where you want to be. And they're telling you, don't do that or do this instead. But even just having Dan as a co-founder there, I mean, there was a lot of times I wanted to give up that he lifted me back up. And there was a lot of times I know he did. And I know I lifted him up. Unless you're strong enough and one of those even rarer exceptions who's just it's like a bull and is never going to give up and you can do it all on your own. But I needed someone. I couldn't have done it without having someone reminding me why we were doing it and to keep going. Yeah. Last thing I want to ask you is about college. You started this idea of college. You're at a Great university, very well known private school here in North Carolina, Wake Forest. There's a lot of talk right now. Things are different. COVID, people aren't able to go to school. Some people are taking gap years. Some they're not having the same experience. Conversations happening. Wake Forest is not a cheap school. There's and that's just one example. What's your take on college? I mean, obviously you worked on a project that led to this, that led to that, and here you are today. What's your look at college? And obviously it's going to be different. I don't think there's a one answer for everybody. But as you kind of think about things, if you're giving advice to people that maybe might be in high school or even younger, they're saying like, what should I do? Where do I want to go? What's this college thing? A long time ago, it wasn't that way. And the next thing it was like, it's expected. This is the dream. This is what you do. You go to college, perhaps you crew a lot of debt and maybe get a job after school or not. But what's your take on it? Yeah, I mean, I could get on a soapbox for hours. Yeah. I mean, I've <laughs> felt that our whole lives, right? Like we're conditioned to get good grades or start doing well in middle school, but really high school start, you got to get A's, you got to do well in the SAT, the ACT, start comparing yourself to other people so you can get into that top university. And it's like, why is that important? But then, all right, so, but you just believe like, this is the absolute truth. Then you get into this college. All right, now it's get good grades here and compete against your peers and do better than them and get an A so that you can go get a big boy or big girl job at a Fortune 100 company and there goes the rest of your life, right? And yeah, like, yeah. to me, I always question, I was like, there's got to be other paths, right? And I hate how society or the university system or education system pushes like, this is the only path. There are so many others that no one talks about or doesn't talk about as loudly as the ones that I think 90% of people are kind of pushed into. And so Wake Wash, our college laundry business is what opened my eyes for the first time to there are magnitudes, multitude, you know, so many other paths to go down. And I'm glad that universities are starting to adopt more entrepreneurial you know, programs and whatnot. But that was it for me. I learned more doing that than any class I took at Wake. And that's not to you know, put a knock on Wake. I think universities are important for the connections you make. And just the idea of teaching you to learn, how to learn quickly, how to problem solve. I don't remember calculus or exactly how to do it, but I know it made me use a part of my brain that now I pick things up probably faster as a result of it. And for that, I guess I'm, you know, I'm grateful for it. But I learned more practical real life skills running a laundry business in college than I did taking any $4,000 credit class at Wake Forest University. And I, I go back to Wake and I say these things. So I'm not ashamed of saying it or again, feel bad for saying it. 
And I tell that to high school kids, college kids that I meet, same thing is if you have a, this belief and passion and are motivated enough to self-educate, don't go to college, go watch a bunch of YouTube videos. It's the same shit they're teaching you at Harvard or Wake Forest. You can find it all online for basically free. And then you just go just do it, whatever it is. I mean, if you have a, some sort of profession where you legally have to get educated, like being a doctor or a lawyer, yeah, you kind of have to go to school. But if it's business or if it's working for a nonprofit or some other passion that you might have, you don't have to go rack up all that debt and go to school. There's so many free resources out there. Use those. And if that doesn't work, you can always go back to school and make that decision. It doesn't have to be, oh, I graduated high school. I hit 18. Now it's time for the next step in right. the game of life. And college is there. It's Yeah. I wish there were more advocates for that because I think kids, you don't know any better at 18 and you're just doing what your peers are doing. You're doing what your parents are thinking is best for you and not really making your own decisions. For a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Well, I think you said at the beginning too, I think we could have an entire episode just about that. (laughs) I'll ask you this follow-up question. If you're hiring a CFO tomorrow to come to TU Laundry, are you looking at their credentials of where they went to? I mean, obviously it's going to play a part of it, but is that going to be a deciding factor of like where their finance degree is from? No, I try to eliminate as much bias as absolutely possible. I mean, I'm sure there's parts to people's decision making throughout life and getting into that top school is something that's considered, but it's not as much weight as I saw happening at again, I don't mean to be calling companies out, but it's only my experience, but at EY. I mean, we'd look through and there would be internal conversations about this person versus that person. And I knew the other person was better based on their experience, but I was like, oh, this person's safe because of their GPA. And I was like, this is why are we taking the safe bet yeah. every time? Yeah. That's interesting. I'm glad you shared that. Well, Alex, I could just see it. Your level-headedness, you're very humble, very smart. I appreciate it. I mean, just good CEO and it's good to be around people like you and share these stories. I mean, having these types of conversations helps me out. So I appreciate you guys reaching out. I'm, it's good to see where you guys are at, what two laundries up to and, and where you're going to go. And I've no doubt our dryer or washer is going to break or we're just going to be <laughs> sick and tired of it. And we're going to call you guys up. It's so easy. My wife just hops on and there you go. And you guys are showing up at the door and like, Usually like the next few hours are within the day. So we appreciate it. But more than anything else, I appreciate your time today and just all the stories and all the stuff that you shared with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The feeling is entirely mutual. I mean, I think what you're doing for the startup community, for other business owners, for other influencers and personalities, I mean, just getting the story out and letting listeners hear. I mean, again, for me, when we first started that first 10 months, listening to podcasts like yours, listening to others. I mean, if this conversation we just had got one person, one nugget that allowed them to continue to be uncomfortable or to continue to persevere, it's worth it a hundred times over. So thank you for giving the platform for not just me, but for others to be able to get that out there and hopefully inspire at least one person out there to, to go yeah. do something. That's awesome, man. I appreciate you saying that. It means a lot. Well, thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you. One of my favorite things about CadSource is the opportunity to chat with amazing business leaders and entrepreneurs. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you want to connect, you can find me on LinkedIn or visit us at CadSource.com. Thank you for listening to this CadSource production, Entrepreneur Perspectives, building and protecting your business one podcast at a time. This episode exists because of CadSource. CadSource is your content team. You know how many business leaders need help communicating their story? That's what we do. Content strategy, creation, and distribution for business leaders. This provides opportunities, relationships, and a platform for you and your business. Why do we do this? Because at CadSource, we exist to help you create and share amazing content. And yes, you should have a podcast. We'll help you. Learn more by visiting kezcontent.com.